do welcome Patrick McGuigan. He is what, the man. What's this move? <laughs> am I, am I, I'm, I think I'm looking at, oh, I see, we're in gallery view. There we go. Um, oh, yeah. I just could just see you in, in large. I've, I've changed it now. <laughs> Um, well, I'm hoping everybody can see both of us side by side. So, um, yeah, welcome and amazing congratulations on your fantastic book, The Philosophy of Cheese, which has come out perfect timing for the Christmas market. <laughs> um, and Patrick is a, he's going to tell you a little bit about himself because he's better at that than me. Um, but he is our, I'll just quickly add he is works with us at the academy um, as our cheese librarian basically so from the very beginning Patrick has written up the cheeses that we all study so the 25 at level one and then the 75 at level two and he's now working on I hope this the other 200 at level three which um, we yeah. We'll have start launching in April 2021. So very excited about that. But so over to you, Patrick. Chat, chat, chat. Tell us about yourself, and then I'll ask you a few questions, and we'll start tasting some cheese. I want to eat some cheese. I'm hungry. I've got a nice cheese board in front of me. Uh, so I'm uh, Patrick McGuigan, um, retired footballer, uh, <laughs> and um, so the, all yeah, of you that were early in the chat. Uh, yeah, I've got an injury from football. Anyway, you had to be there. Um, so I'm Patrick McGuigan. I'm a, a journalist. Uh, a, a first and foremost, I'm a, a food writer uh, and have been uh, writing about food for 20 years nearly, which is kind of mad. Um, and then have, have, I mean, I write a lot about all sorts of food, restaurants and um, all sorts of uh uh, food types but then over the past sort of 15 years I suppose I've specialized in cheese um, and I write for newspapers and magazines uh, the Telegraph and Delicious magazine and uh, the Financial Times sometimes uh, and lots of other people uh, and it's a great honor really to be able to write about this subject because what it allows me to do is go and visit cheese makers and cheesemongers all over the world um, and I've been you know, up the Swiss Alps and all over France, or certainly all over the UK visiting people. Um, <laughs> it's great. New York, the hipster cheese bars of New York and Vermont a couple of years ago. Um, and it's a real honour because I'm allowed to go into dairies uh, and, and, and watch people make cheese, make cheese with them sometimes, and just spend hours asking them lots of questions uh, and writing about it. Um, so that's me. And then I sort of moved from just writing to doing more talks and tastings and events. I set up a cheese festival in London uh, with some friends a few years ago uh, and um, then have started doing training for the Academy and have worked quite closely with the Academy since it launched really in 2017. Yeah. Uh, so I teach both level one and level two. Um, and I've been doing that with the School of Fine Food in London for quite a long time the, at the Guild. Um, and then when uh, lockdowns hit, I went online uh, and I've been teaching level one every month, basically ever since. Which has um, been brilliant, hasn't it? You've, it's every course has sold out. Yeah, they've all sold out, which has been great. It's great to see that there's so much interest and it's all sorts of people who come, you know, it's, 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 you know, people who are in the industry, but also lots of just members of the public who are really interested in cheese, which is, um, which is quite encouraging, really. Um, so there are, I, I don't have a course in December, but you know, January, February, March, there are places still available, um, perfect Christmas present. Um, and then, so the other, the other thing that happened, it's been a really weird year. So at the end of last year, I was approached by the British Library um, who have a series of books called The Philosophy Of. Um, and the first one started with The Philosophy Of Beards. I uh, think I want that one. They basically reprinted a manuscript, I think from like the 19th century, and it was a kind of treatise on, on how men should grow beards and care for them. And they reprinted it like it was, you know, it was a 150 year old bit of text and they reprinted it and it was really popular. So then they sort of moved it into the food world. So there's the philosophy of tea, the philosophy of wine. And then they approached me to do philosophy of cheese. And they're essentially sort of short histories of a particular food or drink. Um, so the philosophy of cheese, um, I wrote quite a lot of it in lockdown which was weird I, I did a lot of research in the British Library finding old texts and and um you know academic papers and so on 
uh, and then and then wrote a lot of it in lockdown. It was as I was coming out of writing it that I realised that the cheese industry in Britain was about to implode. No, and then you uh, phoned me and said, "Should we do the British Cheese Weekender?" And so we organised <laughs> that. So it's been a crazy year. Thanks. But in a, in a nutshell, the book is it's uh, eight thousand years of cheese history in one hundred and twelve pages, and each chapter is a different cheese. So you, we start with the first curd. Um, and then finish with an American cheese called Rogue River Blue, uh, which won the World Cheese Awards in 2018. Eight, yeah, no, 2019. Yeah, 2019, um, last year, yeah. And it's kind of, I, I look pretty much at European and, and American cheese, basically. It's Western cheese that I'm looking at. Um, so we've got chapters, I've got chapters on Parmesan and Pecorino and Roquefort, Gouda, uh, Cheshire, Can Cheddar. That's how cool. you went about selecting? Because I mean, oh wow! In our in, in our world, we have so many cheeses, so many amazing cheeses. Um, how did you decide which ones to? Yeah, it was see? quite hard. I wanted cheeses that represented a period of time, so that, that there was a chronological order. Um, sort of when the cheeses were either first made or when they sort of really rose to prominence. So that helped a bit. Um, and I wanted to get a nice range of styles. So I kind of wanted it to be like, a, it would be an amazing cheese board if you put all, I think there's 11 chapters. If you had that, the whole book as a, oh, as a okay. cheese board, it would be really good. Um, so there's goat's milk, there's sheep's milk, there's a couple of blues, there's hard cheeses, you know, it's, it's a nice match. But then I wanted to kind of go through time as well. So from the, you know, the first cheese through to the modern day. Um, so Rogue River Blue is the last chapter. I think the chapter before that is Cheddar, which sort of looks at how cheese became more industrialized and globalized. Yeah. Um, Cheshire is before that, which is, and Gouda is looking at the sort of 16th and 17th century. The Middle Ages, we've got a few sort of, we've got Munster, I put Munster cheese in as a sort of washed rind cheese, which was one of the first, uh, abbey cheeses you know the the, the monks in Alsace yes. um, so I wanted to get these different styles and actually you know teaching the academy course you know we do cover cheese history um, yeah. so I had a kind of uh, an idea but I obviously went a lot deeper um, so. I bet you when so when they approached you to write it you must have been like wow yeah I mean it was brilliant did you feel very honored I mean how did you feel yeah, I mean, it's great, isn't it? You, I mean, normally you have to go and approach lots of publishers and they tell you not interested, you know. Um, so it was lovely that they 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 came to me because that's quite unusual, really. Um, and uh, it's an I mean, actually, for me, the British discovering the British Library was fascinating for me. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been in there a bit over the years, but to actually spend days and days calling up books that like were literally 200 years old you know and and, and having to carefully sort of read them um and they make you wear gloves it was amazing <laughs> yeah i mean like these are proper historical wow. records um Fantastic. so yeah that was great it was a yeah it was a real your mom and dad were proud as well yeah yeah of course i i've got yeah they want me to <laughs> sign their copy but i don't know when i'm going to see it I loved it when we did British Cheese Weekender and Patrick did a, I think he did cheese and wine pairing uh, masterclass for us on one of the nights. It's all gone to be a bit of a blur. Um, sadly, one of the ones that we didn't manage to record. And I remember afterwards, Patrick talking to me and he said, all my family came and watched and they've all phoned me tonight and said, you really do know about cheese, don't you? <laughs> Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always more, it's, it's a brilliant subject because as you think when you know something, then there's something else that proves that you got that bit wrong or, you know, you can never learn everything. And that's what I quite like about cheese. It's a vast, vast subject um, that, I mean, the more you study it, the more you realise how little you know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, I think that's... Yeah. There's always um, something to learn, isn't there? There is always something new to learn. I just, it's phenomenal. I think that's why we all have sort of got the bug, isn't it? The cheese. Yeah, I, it's, and, and even what's happened this year, I mean, with COVID and how that's affected cheese all over the world has been, you know, I mean, that is not in the book because I, I filed the copy. Yes, it but, you know, Even within the six months or whatever it was since I last filed the copy, it's everything's been turned on its head all over again, you know, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things I'd really like to do, for, you know, if, if I ever get the chance to do something like this again, is to, to look at cheeses off the beaten track and, and not look, you know, not in the Western world, but actually, you know, Mongolian horse milk cheeses and uh, some amazing cheeses being made in Latin America and in you yeah. know, here in India and, you know, that sort of stuff yeah. I think would be uh, really interesting. Well, and African well, cheese, North African cheeses as well, but yeah. yeah. We'll see. And I think we've got an Indian training partner coming on, Namatra. I think you've met her or you interviewed. Yeah, Namrata. Yeah, she took my course. And um, it'd be really lovely actually to learn more about Indian cheeses and how they use cheese because she makes cheese as well and she's using some of the, um, you know, some of the ingredients influential in India into the cheeses she makes. So watch this space. That's coming soon. And we'll do some masterclasses with her once she's on board as a training partner. Anyway, shall we crack on? Do you Let's wanna... eat some cheese. Yeah. Cheese and, and, and do you want to? Um, well, I've got a, I've got a cheese board lined up, which is I've, I've picked four cheeses from the book, um, and I, you know, whoever's whoever's um, whatever you've got in the fridge, really, just eat along. I think is probably a good bet. But I, I'm going to start with I've got a curd cheese. Um, it's it's a very simple. Um, I mean, I can sort of show you a little piece of it here. I mean, it's 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 about as sort of simple a cheese as you can get. This is a, a sheep's milk uh, cheese uh, that's made in Sussex called Slipcoat, and it's basically you know you take your sheep's milk, um, you add some starter culture, a little bit of rennet um, to to make your curd, um, and then you basically ladle it into and drain it slightly, and then and then that's it. It's like the most of sort of basic uh, cheese. Um, so the first chapter of my book is on goat's curd uh, and they, it, there's, it's, there's, I mean, we don't know for sure, but if you're looking at sort of what was the first ever cheese in the world, it's probably some kind of simple goat's curd. Mm. Um, and when that was made, again, nobody knows 100%. Um, it all started in the, the Fertile Crescent, uh, which is... Um, an area. I have a little slide, actually. Should I? Should I bring up my? Yeah, share your screen. Are you able to do that? Did I? I can. Yeah. Let me just find uh, where yeah. it is. I might unpin myself, actually, and then. Um... I think you'll just go down the side yeah. maybe, at that point. I've um, made you the, the, the main man. You're the main but, man for now. But as I'm talking, anyway, I'll find this as I'm talking. But essentially, um, the Fertile Crescent. This is sort of the beginning of the Neolithic period. So you know, cheese making goes back at least 8,000 years, probably more like 10. Um, and we're not 100% sure uh, when cheese making started. But what we know is that about 9,500 BC, so BCE or you know, before Christ or before the common era, however you wanna um, uh, call it. So what's that? About 11, about 10 and a half, about 11 and a half thousand years ago, people started to um, domesticate animals. And they think it would have been goats and sheep who are naturally kind of curious animals, particularly goats, and would have come down from the, um, the Taurus Mountains, which are in uh, Iran, um, and would have sort of, these goats would have come down just to see what these new settlements of people uh, would have been, uh, you know, and, and what they were, um, who these people were that were starting to set up little farms. And then that relationship between humans and animals would have started around then. And so it wouldn't have taken long, really, um, to, uh, for, for them to start trying the milk and, and seeing what it tasted like and sort of messing around with it. Um, so I'm just going to... We've got someone asking in the chat where you can get curd cheese. So we've got a few producers um, in the UK and it's become a little bit back in vogue hasn't it yeah chefs love it can people can everyone see oh can everyone see my slides here i don't know if people can yes. see that yeah yeah i can see them i hope everybody else can yes the people yes. In the are saying yes right so that so top left is the the fertile crescent um the the cradle of civilization and sort of before before sort of you know twelve thousand years ago people were sort of hunter gatherers and then there was a climatic change and uh, it got warmer and, and the, the, the seasons were more stable and you could sort of stay put and farm and grow cereals. And where I was saying the Zagros Mountains, you see on sort of south of Iran there, 
Um, that's where they think the first animals were, were um, domesticated. And they would have been goats and it wouldn't have taken too long to mess around with, um, with their milk. And there's, there's, um, they found pottery, uh, like uh, pottery sherds dating back to 7000 BC where they've got milk residues in. So they were definitely putting milk in pots 9000 years ago. Whether they were turning it into cheese, we don't know, but probably they were. It's a good way to, if you've got milk that's going to go off in the Middle Eastern sun, um, a good way of storing it is to turn it into cheese. And what they think would have happened is the natural bacteria in the milk, if you're storing some milk in a pot, the natural bacteria, the lactic acid bacteria would have started to curdle the milk. If you leave your milk out in the summer on the, on the countertop, it starts to curdle. And so that would have happened. Uh, and then they would have got this sort of lumpy milk, this yogurty stuff, drain off some of the whey, and you've got a basic curd, maybe sprinkle some salt on the top and away you go. The, 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 the absolute definite of um, that the, they started making cheese comes from about seven and a half thousand years ago. And you can see on the top right there, that they kept finding these little shards of pottery with holes in. And, and archeologists just, they didn't know what they were. They're like, what? why would you have a pot with holes in? They thought it was for straining honey or perhaps putting little fires in to make like a brazier. But they, it wasn't that long ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, science caught up and they were able to analyze the pottery, sort of deep into the pottery to find that there were protein, uh, dairy proteins in the pottery from, you know, nearly 8,000 years ago. Yeah. And, and what they worked out was that's basically a cheese strainer. You'd put your, you'd put your curd, your sort of coagulated milk, your curdy milk into that, and the, the whey would drain out and you'd be left with a nice little cheese. Um, so, and we're still making cheese, like the curds that we're talking about in Britain, we've got some really good, Neil's Yard Creamery make a, a, a goat's curds, don't they? And um, Yeah, and um, White Lake make the White, White Lake cheese, um, down in Somerset next to Glastonbury, they're making goat's curd. And then we were talking earlier about Juliana of the old cheese room, and she's using Jersey milk to make curd cheese. And she also makes one uh, called Wasabi Pearl. Now that's delicious. Um, but I think there was a real trend, hasn't there been, where chefs have been flavoring curd. Mm. Um, for dips and it's it's just a it, it gives it's got that nice acidity hasn't it yeah so the acidity I mean I'm tasting my slip coat which is I suppose just a fresh sheep's milk cheese but to me it's kind of like it is basically just a simple curd cheese mm. um, and it is it's got a nice sort of citrus uh, flavor to it really like lemony and zingy and then a nice sort of salty finish as well and these cheeses are brilliant as a carry. Like you say, you can add stuff to them, uh, you know, a drizzle of honey, which I quite like to think that Neolithic uh, man and woman would have, you know, they would have had honey. So they, they might have been having goat's curd drizzled with honey, you know, 8,000 years ago, which is what <laughs> you can go to Otto Lenghi in London. Uh, well, you can't at the moment because it's closed because of lockdown. But, you know, that's on the menu in restaurants all over the world, that sort yeah. of thing. Amazing. Um, and Monica's in the chat and she's asking, do we know when they started, if, when, you know, when they started making goat, cur well, curd cheese in the, in the United Kingdom? Yeah, well, cows came over to the UK. I think it certainly by, so, so basically this kind of domestication of animals uh, happened, you know, 10, 12,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. And then there was a kind of, um, actually people did really well and started to proliferate. Um, and actually cheese would have helped in that because it's a really nutritious substance. You know, it's full of fat and protein. And if you can harness that um, and it, it, you know, it would give you an advantage, an evolutionary advantage. And so as, as people proliferated and did well in this area, they started to branch out and move um, eastwards to sort of Mongolia and then up into um, Eastern Europe and then across. Um, and they would have taken this cheese making knowledge with them. So 4000 BC, sort of, you're talking sort of Bronze Age, beginning of the Bronze Age for, for, for cheese making in the UK uh, and Britain. Um, How long and, have we got to carry on looking at this horrible thing on the screen? Yeah, I got to tell you about, 
but look, just just quickly around this, one of the theories that archaeologists have had for a long time is that in in Neolithic times, people were um, lactose intolerant, so they hadn't um, they hadn't evolved. Lots of people in the West can drink milk um, because um, we have uh, an enzyme in our body called lactase. And you have lactase in your body when you're a child, so you can drink your mother's milk and the, this enzyme that you create um, breaks it down, uh, uh, it, it breaks the lactose down um, uh, and so you, you can drink the milk. But in Neolithic times, as people became adults, uh, they didn't make lactase. And so there's a theory that actually everyone was lactose intolerant and the milk from these goats and sheep would have made them quite, it would have given them diarrhea basically. Um, but if you make cheese, the bacteria eats the lactose. And so you end up with a product that's actually very low or, or basically has no lactose in it. And so the idea was that cheese suddenly was a way of making milk more, more palatable. Although there's new research coming out all the time showing that might not be true. Either way, it was a, it was a, you know, a great way to store milk and it would have just been nice to eat, I think. That's, the lady you know. in the left-hand bottom corner looks so. Cool been very poorly she she is she is a mummy she is a mummy from um uh, that was uh this is the oldest fully formed cheese that has ever been found and it was found little lumps of cheese were found around this mummy who was found in a chinese cemetery who'd been perfectly preserved because it's in the in a desert i'm going to try and pronounce the name of um uh, of the of the oldest cheese, so it's in um, uh, Xinjiang in western China. I've probably got that wrong, um, and it's in the desert. So she's been perfectly preserved. She's three thousand um, five hundred years old. Uh, she's called the the Beauty of Zhao He, uh, oh. which was the name of the cemetery. And when they discovered her, her eyelashes were still fully formed, her hair was still there, and around her neck were like a little necklace of little lumps of cheese. Um, and this is the oldest cheese ever, intact cheese that's ever been found. Um, and they, they analyzed the cheese and it was a mix of cow, sheep and goat. Wow. Um, and really interestingly, if you're really nerdy, the, the milk would have been um, acidified with kefir grains. Kefir is quite trendy now. And yeah. I did some research into kefir and I still don't quite understand what they are. It's like a yeast symbiotically growing with a bacteria in these little grains. Um, and you add them to milk and it starts to acidify and culture the milk. Anyway, you know, that's the oldest cheese that's ever been found in a tomb in, in a Chinese cemetery. Um, the one on the right, bottom right, people thought was the oldest cheese. This was found in a tomb in Egypt. Um, uh, and they found these kind of ceramic uh, vases with this weird white substance in, in, a, in a tomb of a, an official um, in Saqqara in, in Egypt. Uh, and I didn't know what it was. And then they tested it. And again, it was cheese. And that's about 3,200 years old. Um, and they think that maybe in both these cases, these were kind of little snacks to sort of help you in the afterlife. You, you would put food with important people so they had something to eat when they passed into the afterlife. Right. Um, and the, uh, the Egyptian cheese, I mean, I was like, well, I wonder what it tasted like. But apparently <laughs> the Egyptian cheese had brucellosis in, in it and, and would, have made you, <laughs> would have made you terribly ill if you'd actually eaten it. Yeah. Um, cool. So those are the sort of, you know, those are the sort of the beginnings of cheese, if you like. This is the sort of first and second chapter in my book. Um, but yeah, she's amazing, isn't she? Look at that hat. The hat's incredible. The, the, the beauty of um, uh, Ji Hai, Ji Hai. Someone will hopefully put me right on how to pronounce it. Um, and and uh, in the modern world, we've got um, Emma Young, the cheese explorer, is actually um, had made teamed together with one of the um, with, with with a creative genius, and they've got mini Mondor necklaces and mini Mimolet necklaces. So cheese round the neck is obviously back on trend. 
Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, yeah, I know I've seen them, and I kind of, I, I used, I used to have a pierced ear actually. I wonder if it still would work. I could get a little <laughs> monitor uh, earring for Christmas. I'll send you one for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just having a look at some of the some of the chat. Yeah, um, I've got some aged gouda here, and it's smelling very lovely. It's smelling super um, caramelised. It's making me very hungry. Yeah, there's a, there's a Catherine Spencer who is at the Cheddar Gorge Cheese Company. She's working with Bristol University, analysing their milk curd and two-year-old cheddar and comparing it to Neolithic pottery with traces of dairy products too. Yeah, it's Bristol University have been at the cutting edge of all this, of, of kind of analysing these um, pottery sherds. Um, let's we move on to the next cheese. Yeah, let's do that. So what are we looking at next? Well, I, I'm jumping around through time and space. Uh, so, uh, we, you know, the book would go through the Roman period and the Middle Ages. I'm going to fast forward, uh, basically because it works better on the cheese board, to Cheshire. Uh, okay. So we've gone from Neolithic cheese making uh, and we're going to fast forward through, uh, you know, a couple of thousand years of or several thousand years of uh, cheese history uh, and end up in Britain in the 17th century. OK, and then we're going to go back to the Middle Ages with Roquefort. So I'm all over the I'm, I'm, go, I'm following the cheeses as I would eat them on a cheese board rather than at where they come historically. Um, so we've got a, I've got a lovely piece of um, one of my favourite cheeses. Uh, Kirkham's Lancashire is still my fave, but I have to say Appleby's Cheshire is fast. I've been eating a lot of this during like look at this tiny, gorgeous little wedge. Yes, fantastic. Um, raw milk, still still made with the raw milk in Shropshire. On the cows are grazing on the Cheshire Plains. On the Cheshire Plain, yeah. Um, they're neighbours of mine actually in Shropshire. Um, amazing cheese and just keeping to the very core values of traditional handmade cheeses wrapped in cloth matured in the um, stores maturing stores all on the farm amazing it's 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 such a it's sort of gentle cheese but that doesn't mean it's not complex and full of interesting mm. stuff but it doesn't you know i love these territorial cheeses where they don't give everything to you at once you have to go back to them and, and you've got to eat them I read and some at Neil's Yard Dairy's website. It said this is not a nibbling cheese. This is an eating cheese. You have to eat mm. it properly, you know. And, and really you really think about shouldn't. It. You should eat it on its own as well, I think, because then mm. you get the true sort of full depth of the flavours. I'm sorry, I haven't got any to share with you. Um, so you're going to um, have to give us the tasting notes. Well, it's lovely. Um, I was speaking to Sarah Appleby the other day for an article, and she. Um, she always describes, she, she's got a lovely way of describing her cheese as being sort of juicy and succulent, which I think is really true. It's got a kind of really juicy acidity to it. You know, my mouth's watering just eating it. But also it does have a kind of minerality. I always think it does have that. It's not salty. It's more on that sort of like licking a stone, you know, not that I yeah. go around licking stones very often, but, um, but you know, that's, that's sort of, yeah, that sort of stony, minerally, almost yeah it's quite hard to put your finger on but i i love it and then it's very savory and has a nice kind of long savory finish which i think is delicious. And the, sad, the thing that makes me quite sad about cheshire is that if you buy some cheshire block cheshire from a supermarket off the um pre-packed i think it gives cheshire quite a bad rep because yeah. it's fairly bland um it's you they usually sell it with the anato coloring in it so it's orange so people think it's going to be great but if if we truly recommend if you can go to a cheesemonger or a deli or a farm shop that's got a cheese counter they will more than likely have applebee's cheshire because it is one of our iconic cheeses from the uk one of our stoics and it is beautiful, but and you've got that real depth of flavour, and oh. it's not like nothing other. So if you say Cheshire, I mean um, we've still got Balton as well um, in in North Shropshire, and they're still making some pretty good Cheshires, um, well some really good Cheshires. But this Applebee's is raw milk, so you have got that even you know bigger depth of flavour, haven't you? Yeah, I oh, see. I mean they're both you, you, a sort of block Cheshire in the supermarket. And Applebee's Cheshire, they're both called Cheshire, but to me they're totally different cheeses, really. You know, 
they, 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 their flavour and texture are, are, are very different because they're made in such different ways. Um, Cheshire is a is a is really is a really fascinating story. I loved I loved researching uh, uh, Cheshire cheese. Um, this uh, I'll skip to Gouda. Let's move away from Gouda. This is Cheshire. Here we go. Um, yeah. yeah, Cheshire. It, that's the Cheshire Plain at the bottom, um, which is a, a large plain that sort of stretches from from Cheshire down to Shropshire, um, and it, there's a lot of salt underneath the the, the plain. Um, actually, they mine, there are salt mines underneath the Cheshire Plain. Um, and so when I was talking about that minerality in Applebee's, you know, it come from, it's directly coming from the grass into the cows and into the, to the milk. I certainly think that more recently I'm getting that minerality anyway. I, I, I think talking to Sarah, the, the cows are out a lot more now mm. grazing on the pastures. And so you're really getting the sort of terroir of the, uh, you know, of the place um, being expressed through the cheese. But Cheshire is an interesting one because in the, you can sort of, Cheshire was just a little local cheese uh, in the 17th century. And the cheese of choice, certainly at the beginning of the 17th century in Britain, it was all made in East Anglia, um, in, uh, uh, in places like Aldborough, actually. There was a lot of dairy, dairying there. Um, and so the, 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 the cheesemongers of London would, would take their cheese from, from Suffolk, uh, and uh, all over East Anglia. And slowly over time, the cheesemakers of East Anglia got a bit greedy um, and they kept skimming their milk to make butter. So taking the, the butter fat out to make butter and, and then using the, the, the skimmed milk to make cheese. And they kept, they skimmed and skimmed and skimmed until actually their cheese became very thin, and very hard and not very nice to eat. Uh, and it was, it became a bit of a joke, um, East Anglian cheese. It was it was the sort of the big seller in London, but got this reputation as just being sort of hard and inedible and was known as Suffolk Bang. Um, and, great quotes um, in your book about this, isn't there? Yeah, and, and there was some great... Yeah, so Daniel, Duf Daniel Dufoe, who was a great British writer, um, did a tour of Britain and, and sort of wrote about quite a lot of the cheeses as part of his book. Um, and he described it as perhaps Suffolk Bang, this is not Cheshire, Suffolk Bang is perhaps the worst cheese in the world, uh, is how he described it. And there were sort of stories about you could break down walls with Suffolk Bang, it was so hard. <laughs> and a lot of it went to the, um, to the military and the soldiers were getting fed up with gnawing on this, this really horrible uh, thin cheese. And so uh, a merchant in London, um, who was from Cheshire originally, took a punt. And he decided, he remembered Cheshire cheese uh, as being delicious. And, and in, in Cheshire, they still used whole milk to make the cheese. And he, he decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk. And he, he commissioned 20 tonnes of Cheshire cheese to be delivered by boat to London. Wow. And on, the, on this was the date, the 21st of October, 1650, um, uh, a, a consignment on the cargo ship the James or the James cargo ship turned up in London, 20 tons of it, and the cheesemongers went nuts because they've been they, all they've been dealing with was this Suffolk bang. Suddenly they got this beautiful, uh, soft, flaky, full fat um, cheese from Cheshire, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. And so from 1650, when basically the first major consignment came down to London. Everybody went nuts for Cheshire cheese and everybody wanted Cheshire cheese. And poor old Suffolk Bang was out at this point. And over the next sort of 50 to 70 years, Cheshire cheese became the king cheese in Britain. Mm. Um, and I had some figures on it. So you yeah, have 1650, the, the first cargo, the first significant delivery. Um, by 1729, there were five and a half thousand tonnes of Cheshire being brought down to London in, in sailboats called ketches um, and on barges. Uh, they would come down the canal network. Um, Suffolk Bang by 1729 was about 900 tonnes. So Cheshire had completely blown it's Suffolk Bang. Market, yeah. and, and what was interesting is these little farms in Cheshire suddenly had to scale up, you know, and, and there's a great book um, by a, 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 that I used as part of my research, where he, he looked back at how the farms expanded, you know, and they started off with sort of 10 cows. And then in the space of 20, 30, 40 years, they'd had to scale up massively. And the cheeses got bigger as well, because if, you, if you're bringing a cheese down on a, 
on a sail ship which takes you know days possibly weeks to come down to london small cheeses dry out and so they started to make bigger cheeses that would that would and then they wrap them in cloth to protect them a bit on, on the journey to keep them safe that's that's cool isn't it and that's what and that's what applebee's cheshire is today you know it's you can yeah. see in the top left it's a cloth bound cheese um and that's you know it, it sort of sticks to those more traditional processes where they they press uh, applebee's they press the cheese in these old-fashioned uh, presses where they sort of and screw still, it. they've still got those presses yeah, yeah that, that's that's applebee's so that's yeah, you these sort yeah. of manual screw press. I think I've spoken to Paul and Claire Apple, Claire um, Downs, who is, is Paul's um, sister. They tell tales of going actually with their dad and their granddad down in the Land Rover, down to London to hand deliver the cheeses. They were still doing that up till quite recently. Rather than using couriers, they would, especially if there was an emergency, you know, a desperate need for it, they would all jump in the Land Rover and take these big eight kilos isn't it of um, Cheshire down to ta down to London which is fantastic but Cheshire Cheshire so Cheshire was it's a kind of an amazing story Cheshire because it's a story of sort of rags to riches and then back to rags again because yeah. you know by the 18th century Cheshire was king and everyone wanted this lovely succulent rich Cheshire um, and then as Britain industrialized and the railways were put were put in um, it was easier for farmers uh, to get their cheese to London. So people like in Somerset could finally start getting their cheddar into London more easily. Um, and also you had things like milk trains. Um, so you could get milk into city centres much more easily. You had like refrigerated uh, carriages that could get milk into city centres. And so farmers said, well, blow making cheese. I'm just going to sell my milk. It's a lot easier just to sell milk. Mm. than it is to turn it into cheese. So in 1900, uh, there were still quite a few Cheshire makers. It was about a couple of thousand left. And that it, that's a, a Cheshire cheese fair in Whitchurch from 1902 um, in the top right hand corner. You can see all the cheeses laid out on, on straw. Um, but by, after, by the end of the Second World War, there were only 40 Cheshire farmhouse Cheshire cheese makers left. And today there's only two, which is mm. Applebee's, I mean, who are making raw milk farmhouse, you know, traditional cheeses. Cloth -backed. Yeah, cloth bound. Um, and that's Applebee's and HS Bourne. So from being a sort of a little regional cheese to the kind of toast of London, and, and Cheshire is now a very you know, sort of an endangered cheese, the, the very traditional mm. stuff. I mean, there are we, lots we, of other we, Cheshire makers. Uh, but... Yeah, we need to get people tasting the real McCoy, don't we? So we really do. So out there, people talking about cheese, selling cheese, all you cheesemongers, get talking about proper Cheshire, please. Yeah. <laughs> right. I've got, there's Claire, Claire Jackson's uh, dropped in a message. Yeah, She's got a fantastic Slate. cheese shops in, in East Anglia called Slate. And yet yeah, it must be pointed out that Suffolk yeah. cheese today is, is fantastic. And I would quite like one of the Suffolk cheesemakers to recreate Suffolk Bang, just to see how <laughs> yes. bad it is. That could be quite a fun project. Um, yeah, definitely. Johnny would be up for that, wouldn't he, at Fen Farm, who makes uh, Baron by God? I'm yeah, sure. you'd have to take all the you'd have to take all the uh, the fat out basically and make a really bad cheese. But it'd be a fun sort of. Uh, oh, it'd be low fat cheese. The, the dieters would be happy, wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, what are we on so to next? We've got Gouda. Um, so Ooh. Gouda's uh, a chapter. I think the, uh, Gouda's the chapter before. Um, uh, Cheshire in the book. Um, Gouda is a really interesting one. So it, it was, it's kind of, it's heyday Gouda was a sort of a similar time to Cheshire, perhaps a little bit before. Um, and Gouda is an example of how um, Europe was coming out of the Middle Ages, out of this sort of dark period of, um, you know, feudal rule and, and where the, the monasteries had huge power and people lived, you know, if you, if you weren't born into nobility or, or, or into the church, you were, you led a pretty tough life as a peasant, essentially. Um, <laughs> but um, Holland, Holland in the 16th century and the 17th century, it was sort of the Dutch golden age, where um, Holland, you know, in, in the Middle Ages had been a bit of a wasteland, it had been marshland, really. 
um, and it had been reclaimed uh, by people uh, using windmills to pump out the water um, uh, and, and dike, you're using dikes to stop water coming in onto the land. Um, and they created these quite fertile fields called the, the Dutch polders, and they were quite good for keeping cows on. Um, and often the land, you know, in return for reclaiming the land, the, the nobility that owned it would say to the farmer, okay, well, you can have some of it. And so these farmers would suddenly start to get a little bit of land and they could start, you know, being self-sufficient and, and having more than just a couple of cows, maybe having five cows, maybe having 10 cows and making cheese that you could sell at the market. And the more money you made in profit at the market, you could buy a few more cows. And so this sort of this golden age where Holland was sort of seen as being at the forefront of uh, um, of, of science, this new emerging thing of science um, and trade and, and military power as well, the, you know, and exports. The Dutch were really good at exporting their cheeses as well all over all over the world. So Gouda is kind of when Europe comes out of the, the golden age, uh, comes out of the Middle Ages and comes into this sort of, I suppose it's sort of entrepreneurial farmers who are yeah. making a few bob with quite interesting new cheeses. And Gouda was one of them. Gouda was sort of developed around this period um, with nice round sides. So you could put it in barrels and ship it long ways on ships and export it. Um, and they did this process called washing the curd. Um, which gave you a nice sort of sweet flavour profile. And they came up with new technologies of sort of pressing cheeses. So they were quite hard and you could age them a long time. And yeah. Durable for sort of taking to market and, and selling, you know. So it was sort of like quite an innovative, yeah, Gouda's quite an innovative cheese. It was the Dutch farmers kind of coming up with new stuff. And it's, they sell, they, I think even then they sold it in massive volumes, didn't they? But even today, now, it's the volumes of Gouda's that get sold. It's huge, in the, yeah. In, in the Netherlands, it's phenomenal, isn't it? I think you've done some, have you done some recent work on that, on sort of volumes of what's getting sold? I haven't got the, I haven't got the figures, no, I don't. I mean, the, the, a lot of Gouda is quite industrially produced now. Although there are, I mean, I've got one, mine's from Paxton Whitfield, and it's a, um, it's a two-year-old unpasteurized Gouda, which is quite hard to find. Yeah. Most, most of it is, is, is a bit younger than that and usually with pasteurized milk. Um, but you can get, so Gouda is, is, the, is a town where it had a market, the Gouda cheese market, and that's where everyone would come um, and uh, with, their, with their cheeses from their little farms and trade, you know, and, and, and make, make some money. And it's still, you can visit the market. Well, I don't know if it's running now. Have um, you ever been? I've never been, no. And it's, no, one, it's, on, my, it's on my bucket list of things to do. Um, I love the picture that they they used for the Gouda chapter in your book, because that is of the market, isn't it? But that was Alkmaar. That was Alkmaar ah, Market. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm on the wrong page here with my, my slide. Um, but yeah, that was that was Alkmaar, but Gouda would have been the same. Like, there were huge hives of um, trade and entrepreneurial kind of bargaining. And um, I'm just going to, I don't know what's happened with my slide there. I'm just going to redo that. Um, Eat a bit Gouda, what are you thinking about it? I've got, there's some nice pictures. I found a fantastic book uh, from the 19th century, um, which was, had some lovely drawings of how, um, Gouda was made um, historically, and some of the inventions uh, that that came up. Is referenced with. in the back of the book? Yeah, it, it's it, it's all in the um, it's all in the uh, in the bibliography at the end. Well, as soon as lockdown's over, I'm going to the British Library because you and Sam Wilkin have been chomping on about it, saying how wonderful it is. Well, Here we go. Look, and yeah, no, I just want to get there. That's the market on the left there. So you oh, can go right. and visit. I think it's a bit of a tourist uh, display now, but they yeah. still bring in big wheels of waxed gouders. And they do this elaborate kind of, um, lots of, they do this sort of hand slapping thing uh, as they're negotiating over how much they're going to buy the, the pallet of cheese for. They, they keep slapping hands until eventually they agree on a price and then they shake hands. Um, and I want to see this hand slapping thing. And, and they still come in on horse and carts with the, 
with the um, with the cheeses as they would have done in the 16th and 17th century. I was talking about some of the technology that they came up with um, for Gouda. The top right, this is from this lovely book I found. This is a this is a cheese press uh, for for so. <laughs> I thought this was brilliant. That the the bucket underneath the plank that he's sitting on would have yeah. been uh, like a where the uh, where the curd would have been, um, and so to put pressure on the curd to make like a cheese press, the cheese maker would have sat on a plank, and the weight of the cheese maker and the leverage would have pressed down on the curd and squeezed some of the weigh out. <laughs> and the these these Dutch farmers came up with all sorts of clever inventions and and um you know things things like clever vats and they were very good on cleanliness and hygiene as well yeah, I'm just um, so i'd read that that it was all they you know they they kind of put in this structure of the hygiene side of it and um improved the quality in that way so dairy maids you know cleanliness was very important the, the dairy maids who, who made the cheese often you know they had to wear very clean clothes and their hair was covered you know it's kind of like the beginning of food safety I suppose yeah fantastic. and then bottom right is 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 cheese gouda was so important in Dutch life um, and this new emerging so sort of, you know th there was a kind of renaissance to do with you know, art and science so cheese turns up in quite a lot of, um, of, of some of the great works of art um, in Holland at this point. So this is uh, a, a Clara Peters uh, picture from 1615, I think. And you can see a piece of Gouda. You, that's a big bit of Gouda um, on the plate there. And you can actually see the, if you look closely, you can see where a cheese iron has gone into it. On the top, there's a little hole um, oh, here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but just here, that, oh, yeah, that's where a cheese iron's gone yeah, into, yeah. into the cheese. So cheese was used in these still lives because the Dutch were proud of their, their emerging uh, commercial um, uh, industries. But also I was reading an interesting paper that cheese at this point, they still didn't really understand the science of cheese. And there was something a bit mysterious still about what, how milk was, like the alchemy of turning milk into cheese. Um, and they still didn't quite understand that the bacteria were involved, you know, that, what role bacteria played. So there was some thought that actually cheeses were, 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 were put into paintings often because people were fascinated by them. There was something still quite magical about cheese at this point. Well, and they do look beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, all of us go into any cheese counter, any delicatessen, any, you know, cheesemonger and you just it's you I'm in awe still in awe of all the different colors and textures I'm not sure about those dodgy things at the front what are they that's a pretzel at the bottom left I think that's a, that's a pretzel and some dried fruit at the front okay thought um, it looked a bit sausagey yeah I think if you look really closely at the cheese knife um on the bottom you, there's either you can see her reflection in the handle or her name is inscribed on it I think oh wow um but the other thing, just finally on Gouda um, and cheese in general in Holland, the Dutch were one of the first pioneers of the microscope. So that it was it was the Dutch that came up with this device where you could start to see uh, these, this tiny world that, that, that nobody really understood. And one of the first things they did, they used <laughs> microscopes for, oh, no. was to, to put it onto the rind of cheeses. <laughs> And uh -huh. what did they see? But these little in these little mites crawling around. And for a long time, people thought that the, the cheese, the, the mites kind of spontaneously came out of the cheese. That it was just like they were like these magical animals that came out of the cheese. And when they when they first came up with microscopes, it was then that they realized, no, actually, there are eggs. You know, they could see the eggs and, that you know, they started to work out that mites were not some sort of magical creature that spontaneously formed in cheese. I just think it's interesting that it was cheese that they used, you know, this scientific development, the first thing they looked at was cheese. It just shows how important it was in yeah. Dutch culture, you know. Amazing. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I do love those aged gouders. They, um, there's Beamster and the, the Unicas, and you, there's, you do sometimes, I mean, I, so sadly, well, not sadly, I've got a taste of the different Sainsbury's one. So they are, they cotton on to these 
it's vintage Gouda, it's very smooth, it's very buttery, it's got those caramel notes. Um, it's to be honest, aged Gouda is a little bit too sweet for my for my taste. Um, but you can guarantee you put that on tasting in a in a festival cheese festival in a cheese shop. Everybody loves it. It's a it's a real crowd pleaser, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, my... a lot of our cheese makers have started emulating that, haven't they? In the in the UK, the Gouda styles. So we've got a number of British ones, haven't we? So we've got um, Catherine. Mead at Liner Dairies has done the Cornish Kern. Yeah, that's a kind of halfway between a Gouda and a yeah, Comfort, yeah. I suppose. There's there's the Cornish Cornish Gouda, isn't there? Oh, amazing, that, yeah. Which is delicious. Um, and uh, uh, Bath Soft Cheese make a Gouda style cheese, don't they? They're, um, yeah, I really Bath. love the, the Cornish Gouda company ones. He came on our Tuesday night, it's cheese night, and what a character, you know, fabulous young man, really entrepreneurial. Um, of Dutch origins, and then you've got Typhi as well in Wales, haven't you? Yeah, and he was he is Dutch, isn't he, John? Yeah, he's Dutch as well as um, Cornish Cheese Company. They're Dutch, um, and in Ireland as well, there's some really good uh, um, oh, yeah, Dutch cheese makers have moved to Ireland. So there's Coulet, um Coulet. which is amazing from Cork. Yeah, um, the, Will the Willens family, who were originally Dutch, um, I think it's the father and mother came over, and, and now the son's running the business. Um, that, fantastic. You know, beautiful cheese. and cool. Killeen as well which is a, a goat gouda um, mm. which is uh, incredible um, so yeah and you get these crunchy crystals in, in mature goudas which are um, uh, well either calcium lactate or tyrosine crystals so not salt but they're like protein crystals um, well the tyrosine is a, a protein crystal that forms with age um, and they add a nice kind of contrast in texture and I find the really old gouders, I get like, they go beyond sweet and start getting like really weird, interesting, like coffee and cocoa flavours. I think, and sometimes a bit whiny, you know, yeah. like wine, so like red wine or really mature. So you get those sort of, ooh, just scrumptious. Now we've got about five minutes yeah, left. Yeah, let's do the last cheese. Do your rock for, and then I'll ask you, there's some questions here on the question and answer. Yes, of course. So. Uh, Rock for um, so we're going back in time now, uh, from from the kind of sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, eighteenth century, back to well, the the history of rock for you know once you start studying cheese history, what you realise is there's a lot of myth and marketing, and frankly, a lot of people just making it up really. Um, what we do know that it's pretty clear that rock for so rock for is a sheep's milk. Uh, blue cheese made in the south of France in the Aveyron region of France in a place called Roquefort, Roquefort-sur-Soulon, um, there it is, and it's um, the first sort of records are from 1070 and that was when a local nobleman donated a cave, a, rock, a cave in Roquefort to um, the, uh, the local uh, abbey and gave it over to the monks. And so the monks, in my book, the monks keep popping up as these, as these kind of uh, centers of <laughs> cheese knowledge and cheese making um, skill um, throughout the Middle Ages. And Roquefort is one of these. So uh, monks played a big part in, um, you know, what would have been, what would have happened is they would have stored their sheep's milk cheeses in these caves. And lo and behold, they would have turned blue and tasted quite nice. There's, a, there's the old story about Roquefort, which is repeated again and again, which is uh, Roquefort was first invented by a young shepherd who was uh, out with his flock of, of sheep, stopped in a cave for his lunch with a simple white cheese, a, a curd cheese and a piece of rye bread. A beautiful woman walks past his cave and being French, he runs after her, forgets his lunch, comes back a couple of days later and his cheese has turned blue. Uh, and the, the bread's gone a bit mouldy, a bit of blue mould on the rye bread and the cheese has turned blue. And being French, he obviously gives it a go and loves it. And that's the story of how Roquefort was born a thousand years ago. There's no evidence of it. I've searched all over. You know, it's just hearsay. <laughs> you tried to find the evidence. Yeah, I mean, there's no records to show that. And, and actually, Gorgonzola has a very similar story about a young Italian cheesemaker who gets distracted by a beautiful woman and walks off, runs off after her, comes back and, you know, his cheese turns blue uh, a few days later or whatever. So 
Yeah. Once you start digging into it, most of the stuff you think you know about cheese is wrong in terms of cheese history, or, or there's just no evidence for it. Um, Let's go so, with no evidence. Let's not go with wrong. Let's just. Well, go yeah, with or it, it could be true. It could be true. I mean, who knows? It's like an oral history that's been passed down over yeah, generations. Yeah. Um, so Roquefort is, uh, you know, it's got a long, I mean, it definitely has a long history, at least a thousand years. Um, and it's, what's interesting about Roquefort is one of the first protected cheeses. Uh, the mm -hmm. French are absolute masters at protecting their, their food and drink, you know, having appellations for, for wine, you know, so you can only make champagne in Champagne region and, and the same with cheese. And Roquefort's like, was one of the first to be given protected status. And that was in, uh 1411 king charles the sixth he liked it so much he, he specified that rockfall could only be aged in the in the combaloo caves in rockfall so you, you know that's 500 years of protected status in france that's amazing and it was the first cheese to get aoc status in 1925 which uh, you know that would have just been for wine originally but it was the first cheese to get it and it's helped really sort of protect this brand and to this day Roquefort must be aged in, um, spend some time in the caves of, of Roquefort, uh, which I have a picture of uh, just coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and there just an, some interesting stuff around the, the mold, the blue mold. So that um, this is this is Roquefort. You can see on the map where it is. Um, and sort of the picture, the landscape picture at the top next to the map is, um, is you can sort of see how the it would have been a mountain at one point, and then the sort of it, there was a landslide, and half the mountain sort of slipped down the side to create these this network of caves. Um, and you can see in the bottom left, those are those are rock falls aging in the cave. Um, and what's perfect about these caves is they're they're, they're a good temperature. Um, they have a nice gentle airflow. Not you don't want your cheeses drying out, and you can see. It, there's this kind of network of little tunnels and they're called fleurines. Uh, so from the top of the mountain, the kind of plateau at the top, um, air kind of comes down through the caves and just creates this lovely environment. Um, just enough to take the, uh, um, the ammonia away in the, in the cheese room, but not enough to dry out the cheeses. Um, and for a long time, it was thought that the mould, the penicillin rock 40, that is the blue mould in all or pretty much all blue cheeses was actually in the rock, you know, and, and that's why it's called penicillin rock 40. It's from this cave, but there's been more recent research to show that actually these, these mold spores are either in the milk. So it's something the animals eat. Um, so the milk is all sort of pre inoculated almost with these molds, um, or it's actually in uh, the rye bread, um, which was historically you'd leave bits of rye bread in the caves to go blue dry it out and then sprinkle that into the milk to, to seed the mold into the cheese. Um, but actually they think it's something about how the cereal is grown, the, rye, the actual rye cereal is grown, the mold is on the cereal. So it's actually in the bread before the mold, you know, it, 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 it sort of comes into the cave. Right? And actually they've done tests, they scrape bits off the caves of Roquefort and haven't found much blue mold at all in the rock. Um, that's probably going into a bit too much detail. Uh, have you ever been to the caves, Patrick? I haven't, no. That's, that's another one on the bucket list. I tell you, once this lockdown's finished, we've got a lot of tours to do. I know, I know. And, and actually, it's made we'll, me think... We'll go on tour and take some um, the cheese... Academy of Cheese top marks people with us. <laughs> so that's that's my book. That's four That's four kind of uh, cheeses that are featured in the book, and there's, there's 11 mm -hmm. in total. I was going to say, if people want to buy the book... Um, it's available in all good bookshops in the UK. Um, I would I would encourage people to go to use their independent bookshops rather than go with the big boys. Um, because the British Library online as well. You can buy direct from the British Library um, or there's a brilliant new website launch called bookshop.org, which um, is is basically an online platform for independent bookshops. So if you buy your book from bookshop.org, a much larger percentage of, of the price goes to the goes to independents rather than filling the pocket pockets of Jeff Bezos, basically. Um, but you know, it's available, but and, and it's going to come out internationally uh, next year. 
So if you're yes, in the US or further afield. We have requests from our overseas students wanting to buy it, so we're going to have to work out a way of, of, of posting it to them because I don't think it really is now until August or something next year. Can I fire a couple of quick questions? Yes, actually? please do. So from Amanda Harwood, we've got, I've recently got into Cinco Lanzas, which is a Spanish sheep's goats and cow's milk cheese. Can you please recommend any other cheeses that are similar that I could try? I mean, I would say um, uh, Picos Blue is a mixture of sheep's goats and cows, isn't it? Or yeah. it can be, um, which is a blue cheese. Have you got any other suggestions? Of it, Italy does a lot of mixed milk uh, cheeses. They uh, do, don't they? Um, there's there's loads of mixed seasons. And, and it, it, yeah, there's, there's, Italy's big on mixed milk cheeses. Um, I'm just saying, I think in the UK, who does mixed milk cheeses in the UK? There are a few. Quicks have got Lady Prue, haven't they? Which is cow and yes. goat, is that right? The Singletons do a mixed one as well. It's kind of in layers. Um, I'm not sure if it's available. Greg Parsons from Sharpen says, Sharpen, they do. They, I think they do do a mixed milk cheese, don't they? There we go. Sharpen <laughs> cheese is, is a mixed milk. Is that goat and goat and cow? Is it? Is that Jersey and, and goat's milk? Um, oh, here we go. Here's Abby from the British Library Publishing. Uh, she's put up a link uh, on the chat where you can buy it from the British Library. I would encourage you to buy it. If you can buy it from the British Library, please do. because. Uh, and do you know the advantage of that is you can buy at the same time the philosophy of beards. At the, exactly. Bang, and, bang. And grow a beard. <laughs> while you eat cheese <laughs> or of um, wine or of, isn't there a philosophy of chocolate as well yeah uh is there a chocolate i think that might be coming out it's one of coffee philosophy of coffee but so um, right, a couple of other questions from angela is there a particular order that you should eat cheeses on a cheese board e.g from mildest to strongest as i just tuck in and don't bother with the particular well order. you know Girl, angela just tuck I, I think do what you want you know if you want to if you want to eat uh, a, a big honking bit of rock for to begin with and finish with a goat's cheese go for it you know i mean but yeah i mean that's kind of what you're meant to do is start mild and finish strong i mean if you if you tuck into a, a super ripe poiss you, you ain't tasting much afterwards really um so it can sort of cloud your taste when we're judging at the world cheese awards that's generally how we do it we'd go we do. You know, you'd start with your little fresh goat's curds and finish with washed rind cheeses and blue cheeses which are really powerful you can always have a nibble on a, an apple or a glass of wine or some crackers just to sort of reboot your palate. Or water. Um, I, I, think, I, I think the British are very, you know, we are very, um, we tend to stick to the cheese board as the final course and, you know, encourage people to just have a one cheese cheese board for lunch. You know, yeah. just tuck in. You don't, it doesn't need to be a massive cheese board selection. I quite like Every I like the aperitif moment with cheese, oh, which is yes. a, a cold beer and a few slices of delicious cheese mm. before you actually sit down to eat is a really nice thing to do. Yeah. Or a glass of sherry, really cold fino sherry with oh. some manchego, oh, or, you know, in the UK we've got Burkeswell um, or English Pecorino from uh, from White Lake. You know, they're, they're really good, really nice. It, I often I often eat cheese while I'm cooking actually as well just sort of nibble cheese and try it with different accompaniments yeah um, really and I always have it before pudding if I'm having it as a course because the danger is if you have pudding you're too full for the cheese and that is you know I'd rather have the cheese and then be too full for the pudding if you see what I mean um yeah. Um, bless my husband is decorating in the other room and I've given him some of the gouda on some oat crackers with a few grapes to keep him going so that is a peritif there you go yeah yeah um, um, we've got another one here from Tori this is a bit maybe um, hello Tori she's just passed she's just passed her exam successfully Tori yeah, well congratulations done, fantastic and good question we recently bought some Quick's 12 month cheddar sadly it tasted and smelled of damp is that normal or had it failed somehow? I wonder if it was, was it vac packed, Tori, or was it, um, was it, you know, sometimes if it's vac packed, it's, you need to get it out and let it breathe, don't you? 
there's there's i mean there is we we were trying in my i was teaching the academy course last night um with anna who's who's also put up a few questions i see um and we tried some uh westcombe cheddar which is absolutely delicious and that's another cloth bound uh cheddar um and right up near the rind where the, the cloth had been and and you could really taste that sort of you could taste the cave you could taste the cellar it was quite musty and I actually I really the rest of the cheese wasn't like that, but certainly up near the rind, you will get those sort of slightly more musty, um, cave like cellar like flavours in, in, in a cloth bound cheddar. But I mean, the whole cheese shouldn't taste like that. I think what's happening at the moment is a lot of our cheese makers are having to backpack. They're having to portion and backpack because that's how people can sell cheese at the moment during the pandemic, which is um, sad because um, backpacking anything is going to stop it uh, breathing and cheese likes to be able to breathe. So what I would, if Tori, if it was um, uh, take it, backpack, take it out, make sure you let it breathe for at least an hour, isn't it? And then some of those sort of damp, musty flavours will dissipate um quicks can be very different you know as we always say patrick isn't it every cheese is a different vintage you know yeah yeah work, that's that's the beauty of it they're working with different milk every day um rather than the winemakers want work with one um harvest of grapes and they that's that vintage the cheese makers are working every day with different milk and have to adjust them sometimes um, it's not as good as others. Shouldn't happen though. I mean, I would go back to um, Quicks maybe and uh, and tell them and, and if you've got the details, let them know. No, Quicks, are, Quicks are, they're a very, very fine cheese maker. So um, I wouldn't be put, that's not what Quicks should taste like. So I don't no, go back to them and, and buy some more and it'll be that. delicious. Um, um, we've got Alison Tucker's here as well. Hi, Alison. I hope your Spanish lesson went well. I think you're ducking in after that or you survived the Spanish to come here. Thank you. Uh, so um, I note your reference to the first ever global cheese contest of 60 cheeses set up by Talleyrand in 1815 and the 3,804 cheeses in the 2019 World Cheese yeah. Awards, which 250 judges had to work their way through. Patrick, me. <laughs> I did quite a few of them. Yeah, and you did too, didn't you? Yeah, I had one. Well, I had a table, so I think we do about 60 on a table. Um, how many cheeses does a cheese judge taste in a day, and do you ever get cheese out? Well, you do. With, at the World Cheese Awards, you do, I think it's more like four in the morning session, you do 40 to 50 cheeses mm -hmm. in over a three to four hour period. Um, and then if you're there are sort of series of blind tastings in the afternoon as well, leading up to finding who is the supreme champion. And I've, I've been lucky enough to be asked to come back and do those sort of later judgings in a way. So I think by the end of the day, I've probably tasted about 90 cheeses. Um, and, we do get uh, cheese diet, don't we? Do, um, and I, you have to, um, small, little pieces the first year I judged at the world cheese was like 10 years ago I went in all guns blazing massive wedges and by about cheese 20 I was starting to hallucinate a bit um, <laughs> so you do I've learned you just you know you don't need loads you just need to taste it some cheese some judges will spit which I, I personally find a bit gross and and I feel yeah. like you do need to swallow to get the full the full flavor of the cheese um, but things like apples are good for sort of rebooting the palate and you need a break, you know, you have a long lunch break. Um, what, it, what always amuses me though, is the last couple, which was Italy and uh, where were we? Norway the year before that, they gave us cheese for lunch as well. Yeah, that's not, yeah. That's a, weirdly, I always want like meat at, like, when I've been yes. cheese. I want that's like a bit salad. of beef. Mary Quick is always, they're grabbing all the salad leaves, so you have to fight with her over the bits. I of want meat. more protein. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. I get a weird. Uh, I think maybe you're just on a bit of. A, yeah. But yeah, you can. You, you do have to pace yourself, and you do. You do feel a bit like, you know, at the end of at the end of the f the day, you do feel a bit um, like you've had quite a lot of cheese. But I'm always really aware that cheesemakers work so hard and to, to make these products. And, and and they put, I mean, they do. When you go and meet them and talk to them, they put their 
they're not in it for the money you know it's a pure passion for a lot of people they're really kind of you know really trying hard to make the best product so I'm always aware that I have to even if it's cheese 50 I need to assess it in the same really way. well and give it a really good yeah. um a really good chance and not and not get jaded and, and just keep no. you know keep my focus a bit and uh, I think that's why we work in teams okay. usually three isn't it um at most at most of the awards um teams of three so you know you've got you can sort of jolly each other along when yeah. you start yes you're, you're judging in teams so that does help yeah. doesn't it there's, there's a question from Anna who's um, who's taking my course at the moment. Um, we've got the final session on on uh, on Monday, and she's asked how do the mites get into get into the cheese if the maturation caves rooms are so hygienic. Well, the room the rooms are like cellars. You know, they're not they're not stainless steel. You know, completely antiseptic spaces where cheese is matured. They're, 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 they're often you have exposed rock, you have wooden planks, and that's important as cheeses are maturing. You want to create a kind of micro biome for your cheeses so that the microflora of the room itself impacts on the cheese. Um, and so, you know, once mites get in, they're really hard to they're really hard to get rid of. And I, I was saying, I think we were talking about this last night in my courses. We, there's different techniques you can use to get rid of mites on your cheese ranging from hoovering the outside of your tube. Yeah. Mary, the... Mary Quick sort of invented a hoover, didn't she? She's got like a blower, hasn't she? She sort of blows them and then there's a big sucker at the other end of the room. Yeah. yeah. And then at Westcombe, they use a robot that goes along uh, and, and takes the cheeses off the shelf, turns them, spins them and brushes them. Uh, and, and then sucks the, you know, as a sort of a vacuum as it does it, and then puts the cheese back on the shelf. And that robe, that Tina the Turner is is the robot. Yeah. Um, so there's different ways of doing it. Uh, so yeah, that's that one. Okay, we're 15 minutes over, Patrick. Yeah, you have been amazing. Um, well, all, all, I would you. love, you know, congratulations on such a fantastic book. And it is, it's really, really readable. Even if you've got people <laughs> who are not into cheese as much as you are. <laughs> Get them to read it as well because it is. Yeah, it's quite. It's 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 not. You know, it's a hundred odd pages. You can read a. You know, whip through a chapter in, in not very long. It's it's the perfect stocking filler, I think. Um, <laughs> and also, I quite like the idea of people being able to sit down and eat cheese while they read about it. That I think that's a nice way to oh, learn about something. Um, I just wanted to say, Tracy, thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's no worries. It's been it's great been, fun. It's been great and. Um, do check out our website, everybody, academyofcheese.org. Um, we've got lots more virtual courses going on. It's the only way that it's going to be happening at the moment. And more webinars coming up um, with cheese and chocolate. And you're doing a port one. I'm doing cheese and port in uh, in December with yes. me, Port, who are a brilliant uh, port producer. So we have port experts and Patrick Cheese experts pairing them together. Um, and we will have a Academy of Cheese shop, which should have been launched this week, but I think the tech people are struggling at the moment, which will have gift vouchers for the virtual courses that Patrick's offering and the various training partners Charlie and Irish School of Cheese Avril um, and we will have uh, for the e-learning where you just learn self-study online only without the the classroom so um, anyway we've rattled on enough um, yeah but um, yeah but I've have... got I've got places left in January February and March if you want to sign up with me but there are other people um, and yeah like you said the vouchers are coming soon which I think would make which can be redeemed at sort of any time during the year, against, can't they? Against the courses, no problem. Um, which would make a lovely Christmas present, uh, maybe with my book, perhaps, you know, just an idea. Wishing it or what, mate? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Alice, for answering all the questions in yeah, the Yeah, thanks, Alice. For us.